One of Lovecraft's stories. And what do they look like? A massive bubble blob with hundreds of eyes. Oh, well, that's not scary at all. We can outrun a blob. I'm a George can. <laughs> can so, You in the car, get out. And everybody come around to the back of the vehicle. Who are you? George Freeman, sir. This here is my nephew, Atticus, and his friend, Letitia. Where y'all from? Chicago, sir. You're a long way from home. Oh, we're just passing through, taking a little bathroom break, sir, is all. Any of you all know where the sun downtown is? Yes, sir, we do. Well, this is the sundown county. And if I had found you pissing in my woods like animals after dark, it would have been my sworn duty to hang every single one of you from them trees. It's not sundown yet. Sunset is at 7.09 today. That's seven minutes from now. Then we'll be out of the county in six. Now that's impossible heading south on the road you're currently on. Unless you were to speed. And if you were to speed, I'd have to pull you over. Then we'll head north. That might work. Why don't you give it a try? We will, sir. Is it legal to make a U-turn here? Aren't you a smart one? Now, ordinarily, I would consider a U-turn a violation. But if you ask me real nice, I might just let it go this time. Please. Oh, you can do better than that. Say, pretty please. Will you let this smart nigga make a U-turn here? Pretty please, will you let this smart nigga make a U-turn here? All right. Just this one time since you asked so nicely. How far, Uncle George? We got two and a half kilometers to the county line. Can we make Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. We, 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 it's, it's L3. We got to pass the train tracks. What time is it? It's, uh, it's uh, 7 o'clock. Seven o Can we make it in four minutes? We have to.
name is Keith Beauchamp. And I investigate murders. I've dedicated my life to exposing the evils of racial injustice. This time, I'm investigating sundown towns. Towns where African Americans are not allowed to live in, no less be in after the sun had set. In 2011, while investigating the suspicious hanging death of Raynard Johnson of Kokomo, Mississippi for the injustice files, we stumbled across a small southern hamlet called Morgantown. There, I was repeatedly warned not to step foot in this town after dark because of the color of my skin. I later learned that Morgantown is a sundown town. Sundown towns were all white communities where African Americans were not allowed to live or be in after dark. If ever there was a program that was made for this series in Justice Files, it's sundown towns. And the idea of a sundown town is when the sun goes down, people with my skin color are nowhere to be seen. And so uh, we shine a light on this, this really disgraceful situation. And you'll be stunned, I think, when you find out where these towns are. They're not all in the deep south. There are places where you would be shocked to find out where this is going. This is my first time coming to Martinsville, Indiana, checking out the scenery, the terrain, before we actually start shooting. I'm really proud to be one of the executive producers on this program, because when I tell people about this practice, of, of sundowning, of being able to make sure you don't have any black people in your town after certain periods of time. Now, this particular symbol of the black mill meant and acted as a warning to African Americans to get out of town before dark. When I tell them, first of all, they're, they're shocked. Next, they, they're almost incredulous, but then they get angry. And that's what we want. We want people to see this and get angry and demand action. This is a prime example of how deep the roots of evil actually go. That you think you've got them cut off, and yet they pop up in something like this. I'm the executive producer of the show. I knew what we were doing. And yet, when I saw this on screen, it knocked me back. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. We may think that we've gotten rid of an evil, like segregation, but it's still out there. And if we don't stay vigilant, it will resurface. It's, it's in these pockets. But if we don't take care of this, if we don't do something about this now, it's going to grow. Throughout February, we've been sharing inspiring stories of black Coloradans and their contributions to our state. And this week, we're revealing a darker side of our Colorado history. Number 7's Micah Smith is telling the story of sundown towns where Coloradans of color were prevented from living. The beauty of a sunset is captivating. But for decades in our country, the sun setting was an ominous reminder that black people were entering the most dangerous time of day. We don't necessarily have a complete record of all the sundown towns in Colorado. There are a few that posted banners or posted signs to make sure that people knew. A sundown town was an all-white city that banned black people from living within city limits or being in town after dark. Black American West Museum volunteer Terry Gentry says they were especially prevalent during the late 1800s and throughout the 1900s. There were a lot of risks. You could either be harmed, you could be forced out of town, you could be killed. Uh, just quite a few scary things happened. But sundown towns were not a Southern invention. Most can be found across the North the Midwest and the West, with many right here in Colorado. Louisville and Golden, parts of Colorado Springs. Cherry Hills and Loveland. A Loveland Reporter Herald article reveals in the early 1900s, Loveland neighborhoods and HOAs prevented anyone of color from buying a house there. At that time, Loveland had a large sign that read, Welcome to Loveland, nationally famous sweetheart town. 
and a smaller sign underneath read, we observe Jim Crow laws here. We have a situation here where our culture, as expressed in Hollywood and, and to some expense in other, in other media, uh, puts this racism in the South where it isn't. This is the one form of severe racism that the traditional South did not do, but it's all across the North. Sociologist and author of Sundown Towns, James Lowen, has studied sundown towns across the United States and uncovered thousands. In suburbs, uh, there are a lot of suburbs that were sundown towns. Uh, in fact, most suburbs, about 70, 80 percent of the suburbs of Los Angeles, the suburbs of Chicago, suburbs of Detroit. And Lowen says that's why we still have Colorado cities that have virtually no residents of color. But I have to say that most towns, and I suspect almost all former sundown towns in Colorado, have given up the practice. But Lowen said we still feel the implications today. What we have to watch for now is what we call second generation sundown town issues. And that's, for example, um, an overwhelmingly white police force, overwhelmingly white teaching staff that doesn't have much of a interracial curriculum to teach either. Lowen says there's hope for sundown towns, but communities must step into the light and acknowledge their dark histories. Micah Smith, Denver 7. You understand that we must stand against crimes that are meant not only to break bones, but to break spirits. Not only to inflict harm, but to instill fear. In the most recent year for which we have data, the FBI reported roughly 7,600 hate crimes in this country. It's hard for any of us to imagine the twisted mentality of those who'd offer a neighbor a ride home, attack him, chain him to the back of a truck and drag him for miles until he finally died. When I was sitting in Miss Bird's house, listening to her talk about her son's death and how people that did it were part of a club and you got into the club by killing a black person or a Jewish person. They stopped at the convenience store. They had a cooler full of beer. Uh, they had plenty of cigarettes. When he first got in the back of the truck with these guys, he did it voluntarily. And James Bird uh, would go, he was drunk himself. And a pack of cigarettes and a cooler full of beer, he would have gotten in voluntarily. The witness that saw him sitting in the back didn't give us any reason at all to believe he was there except by his own free will. Hey! I doubt James Bird realized he was in uh, trouble until they were already out in the woods and stopped the truck and they began to uh, slap him around and beat him up. photographing and got to what we call a scuffle scene. And then it was obvious there'd been a big fight or something took place there. The grass was beat down. It was apparent to me that it wasn't going to be a hit and run accident, that it was going to be a murder. Um, it was a sickening feeling. I, I knew this little old sheriff was in trouble. You! Give me the chain! Pull his pants off! district attorney's office and the sheriff's office wanted me to review uh, the findings to determine if Mr. Bird was alive 
while he was being dragged uh, on the logging road. As he was being dragged along the uh, surface of the roadway, the elbows were ground down. He must have been able to hold his head off that pavement to avoid the injury to his head. Over the sound of hatred and chaos, over the din of grief and anger, we can still hear those ideals, even when they are faint, even when some would try to drown them out. At our best, we seek to make sure those ideals can be heard and felt by Americans everywhere. Uh, this afternoon, I signed into law the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Amid protests for black lives around the country, about 50 people gathered on a recent Sunday afternoon to call for racial justice in a small town called Vienna in southern Illinois. We have a unique opportunity to stand arm in arm with the people that are hurt by these things. The protest was organized after a group of students at the local high school created a Snapchat group that was changed to We Hate Black People. I know some of the kids that have been in the group chat and they've been nice to my face, but like, that just shows how they really feel. Many of the protesters were from out of town. <laughs> they were met with dozens of local counter-protesters, some with Confederate flags. We can't go into bigger towns until we tackle our hometowns. Why the hell are you separating it out? Because black, life, black people don't get the equality that white people get. Bullshit! They get the same as the white I grew up with white family and black family. I know what it's like. I know. Vienna has a violent history. 66 years ago, a cluster of homes belonging to the town's small black population was set ablaze by white residents after a black man was accused of beating a white woman and raping her granddaughter. In the years that followed, Vienna became known as one of several sundown towns in southern Illinois, towns where black people had to clear out by nightfall or risk arrest, and often worse than that. It was one of many ways residents ensured their town stayed all white. You got all your stuff, right? Though some black people live in the town today, that legacy lingers in a place like Vienna. I feel very, un very uncomfortable, yeah, very uncomfortable. Nicholas Lewis came to town two years ago. When his girlfriend got pregnant, he stayed to raise their son. Mm -hmm. Now he wants to leave. I feel scared or like, or like just even strains going around to the store because I know all ours are on me. I started coming outside more and more and, you know, seeing what it really was. And I'm like, damn, where's the black people at? So you wouldn't born yet, but you're... As for the white residents, many of them don't see racism as a problem in Vienna at all. I never knew racism existed. We got along fine on racism. I was ra I I've, I've had black friends, I've had black babysitters, I've had black people who took care of me through my childhood. Black people nurtured me, mentored me. We were very best of damn friends. People just don't get it, the pain that racism causes. People may say, yo, racism's gone, it doesn't exist anymore, but it's definitely still a problem. James Davis is a truck driver from a nearby town. He grew up knowing which towns to avoid stopping in while driving through. Some people, they might say it and the whole time they're thinking in the back of their mind, yeah, we're still sundown town. We don't like people of color here. <laughs> so you never know. They sing the rising sun. There is some hope for a small town like Vienna to reckon with its past and become a more welcoming place for black people. But Lewis isn't optimistic. It's going to stay the same because this is a small southern town, so they, they don't like change. Noreen Nasser, The Associated Press, Vienna, Illinois.
News at 5 o'clock. It was a haunting murder mystery. A 21-year-old black woman was brutally killed on the streets of an Indiana town with a reputation for intolerance back in the late, late 60s. Now, no one knew what happened to her until our own Sandra Chapman reported on the case, prompting a very unlikely witness to come forward and then speak up. Well, now, for the very first time, Sandra takes us inside of that devastating secret and the path to the accused killer and a brand new book coming out tomorrow. The book includes interviews in the daughter's own words about turning in her own father. Yeah, I told him, I said, I remember you hurting that lady. I remember being there and seeing you do that. And I go, why'd you have me with you? For the first time, you are hearing the voice of Shirley McQueen, the woman who helped solve one of Indiana's most notorious murder mysteries. I remember watching her fall, and he, and I talked about him giving me that seven dollars and told me keep secret. These are excerpts of a taped interview McQueen did for a new book coming out on Friday. Ten years ago this month. McQueen and her $7 secret led to the arrest of her own father, Kenneth Richmond, for the 1968 racial killing of Carol Jenkins in Martinsville, Indiana. McQueen was just seven years old when she witnessed the attack from the back seat of her father's car as he passed through town. For more than three decades, she lived with the nightmare before telling investigators what she knew and revealing to Carol's family those final hate-filled moments. And as I told her, I said, you were seven years old. You were not only terrified to see the girl falling, but you traumatized. Now the story behind the state and national headlines comes to light. In the new book written by the reporter, McQueen called with a chilling message. If the girl was wearing a yellow scarf and was killed with a screwdriver, my father could be the killer. Up until that moment, no one ever knew Carol Jenkins was wearing a yellow scarf. I didn't know she had one, that, and, and Shirley's the only one that, that ever knew it because it was never in the papers or anything about her having a yellow scarf. That detail, along with an anonymous letter written by Shirley's sister-in-law, following my investigative reports into police missteps in the case, led cold case investigators to McQueen. I, I just told him everything I remember about her scar, her yellow scarf and everything. We are not showing Shirley McQueen's face because she wants to retain some privacy in wake of the turmoil she still lives with 10 years after turning her father in. Kenneth Richmond died in custody before he went to trial and without naming his accomplice. But state police say he admitted to the crime. Richmond's attorney, Steve Litz, denies that claim, and police don't have his confession on tape. Shortly before Mr. Richmond's death, he acknowledged his involvement in the death of Carol Jenkins. The detectives told us that he confessed. He didn't speak, but he shook his head yes. Said this guard asked him, did he do it? And he shook his head yes. Yeah, I believe you. I believe you. Paul Davis spent 30 years of his life trying to track down his daughter's killer. He finds it ironic that the answer to the murder mystery was locked away in the memory of someone else's young daughter. And for you to get in there and, and dig like you've done, and, and you've developed uh, some kind of bond with Shirley for her to even want to talk to you the way she did about it. And that, that made me feel good. Like Shirley, Carol's family is still healing. God worked with me for all those years because I was a pretty angry man at first. Forgiving, but never able to forget the cost of intolerance or the town trying to move beyond its past. I feel like she's part of the civil rights movement and uh, she had to give her life to make some people realize that not about color, it's about what a person has in their heart. Now the girl with the yellow scarf has been an emotional and historic journey for everyone involved. It began when Shirley McQueen asked me to write her story back in 2003. It's not an easy subject for her to speak about, not even now, but she shares her thoughts and writings about that night in Martinsville 
and her lifetime connection to Carol Jenkins, the journey to reveal the truth and life with an abusive father. And I know there are people asking, well, what about Carol? What about the town of Martinsville, which was so heavily in the news back in this day when this all happened? Well, Andrea, Carol's parents are extremely supportive of this work and hope Indiana will become a better place because of their daughter's legacy. That hope is also shared by a group of leading citizens from Martinsville now working overtime to try to change the image of their town. And we know that there's a book signing tomorrow, right? There is. And yes. I know you've been working on this for a long time, and we're Absolutely. very, very pleased and happy for you, Sandra. Thank you. And The Girl in the Yellow Scarf will be available tomorrow from 6 to 9 p.m. at Barnes & Noble. That is up north at Clearwater Crossing. Again, Sandra will have a book signing there. We'll also have links to order. Just go to our website at WTHR.com. Sandra, thank you. John? Smell that? Yeah, I smell something. Smells good, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I think maybe we should go to another place, huh? I'll be honest, ain't really very well. Are you kidding? Tell me you don't want one of these pies right here, right, right over here. Them pies look good, Carl, but I kind of lost, lost my appetite when I came in here. My appetite just left. You good afternoon, hungry? Billy. Uh, we like some coffee and a couple of slices of pie. Hey, how do you know my name is Billy? Well, it says it right there on your shirt. If you boys can read so good, how come you missed that sign on the door over there? Oh, that sign on the door that we just, how come we didn't see that sign and say no colors allowed, Chloe? We just rushed in, we was really hungry, so we kind of missed that, but look, we see it now, so bye. Look, on, man, man let's we've been traveling all day. Yeah, let's go. All we want is some coffee and a couple of slices of pie. Is that all right? No, these are whites only pies. But do you have any Negro pies? Hey, uh, Claude, come on now. This woman ain't got the recipe to no Negro pie. Would, where would she get that recipe? Another establishment we can get us some, some pie or something. Come on, how far is it the next 35 town? 35 miles. Yeah, come on, yeah. let's go I'm not driving no 35 miles to, to get no pie. Lady, ma'am, okay? Now, we, we want some pie, okay? okay? We are hungry, okay? We want, Billy, we want some pie. Let me take care of this. Why, why somebody me, got the die? Because you want some pie. Let me take care of that, that's Look here, um, look. We from New York. My name is Ray Gibson, okay? Let's let's talk turkey. Um, how much is it gonna cost to turn one of them white only pies into nigga pie? How about I turn y'all into nigga pie? So you say about 35. 35 miles. Okay, we find, yeah, maybe we find another establishment down the road, you know, where you know we won't have a problem. Yeah, I ain't no uh, white folks so uh, serious about pie down here. We didn't know anything about black folks because we never really saw them. You just did not go to Forsyth County. In my mind, the black people live somewhere else. I thought it was that way everywhere. People of color cross the county line at risk of their lives. And I remember being in the back of a pickup truck in my baseball uniform and walking along behind us, the next group in the parade were Klansmen in white hoods and robes, you know, waving to the crowd. You know, Forsyth County wasn't a place where people had to hide that sort of thing. In the Jim Crow era, Forsyth County, Georgia was a sundown county, a whites only zone where it was either illegal or unsafe for black people to be there after dark. There were times like this all across America at the time, but what made Forsyth unique is that it stayed that way for 70 years, well into the 1980s. One of the frequent questions I got was, you know, why in the world did your family move there? I think one obvious answer is, White people in America don't have to know a whole lot about a place that they move to. You know, the, the risk, the peril, and threat of physical violence in this community was directed at people of color. So it wasn't really directed at us. Patrick Phillips moved to Forsyth County when he was a little kid, and he wrote a book about his experience growing up there. When I started going to, to second grade there and on up through elementary, um, it became kind of clear to me that there was something really um, wrong about the place and almost all of the kids I went to school with you know, used incredibly racist language. Referring to people of color with the n-word, wearing clan robes, all of this stuff wasn't something that people did on the sly and it was in fact a whites only zone. In the mid-1800s during Reconstruction, Forsyth was a mixed county where black people made considerable strides. By 1910, 10% of the population was black, with black families owning 200 to 300 acres of property individually. 
Two years later, in the midst of the Jim Crow era, an anti-black campaign led two neighboring counties to expel its black populations, inspiring Forsyth to do the same. The catalyst was the alleged rape and murder of a white woman by three black men in the town of Cumming. There's incredibly strong evidence to suggest that Rob Edwards was simply picked up as the nearest black man in the area when her body was found. Um, and and that the trial of these two teenagers, Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel, they were 16 and 18 cousins, um, very strong evidence that whatever else, they didn't get anything we would call close to justice. These people in this mob beat down the door and they had weapons, they had crowbars, they had all sorts of things. They went to where the jail cell was. They shot Rob Edwards repeatedly, beat him with a, with a crowbar, took his body and dragged it behind uh, a wagon. And according to the most common stories, they rode around and around the, the courthouse square and everybody had target practice with this corpse. And then they strung him up, strung up his body across the street and, and about a half a block away. But this is a lynching participated in by like a lot of the community. Hundreds of people took part in it. When they were hung, the entire county turned their hangings into a kind of festival day. They all brought blankets and picnic baskets and sat on a hill overlooking the, the gallows and, and cheered and celebrated um, this hanging. It, it feels like a legal lynching in the case of Knox and Daniel and certainly in the case of Rob Edwards, you know, a very, a very horrific lynching um, on the public square. After the lynching and hangings, white mobs terrorized Forsyth's black residents. A black man would open his front door in the morning and he would see a bundle of sticks tied with string just laying on his front doorstep. And that was all it took. Because that was saying, next time it'll be dynamite. There were 48 families who were uh, documented landowners in Forsyth County at that time, black documented landowners at that time. In a matter of days, 1,100 black people were displaced, eclipsing any wealth and progress they'd made during Reconstruction. They had to leave Forsyth County, regardless of what you had, what you owned, you had to leave. Elon Osby is a descendant of one of those families. Her grandfather owned somewhere between 60 and 80 acres of land in Forsyth. I have a home here that's on an acre of land almost, and you're really proud of that, you know? And to think that my grandfather had 80-something acres, it, it's staggering. It hurts, it's sad. And um, I, I can't imagine what my grandfather must have been feeling. Land was more important than money in the bank. And I'm sure that he was very proud of himself um, as a Negro man, you know, to have property like that. Forsyth remained an all-white county for over 70 years, and that pattern of violence against black people continued. The Foster family had barely closed the sale on their new home when they were blown away by an old law. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That's ridiculous. Their move from Folsom to El Dorado Hills was just a matter of miles. But as far as the neighborhood agreement they just signed, they might as well have been worlds, or maybe I should say decades away. They're just really kind of awful uh -huh. and uh, racist and terrible. A few people we spoke with used similar words to describe Clause 13 of the Lake Hills CCNR. It's similar to a homeowners association agreement and leaves no room for misunderstanding. No person except those of the white Caucasian race shall occupy or reside upon any residential lot or plot in this subdivision except when employed in the household of a white Caucasian tenant or owner. And you have to sign off that you agree to these things. Some longtime Lake Hills residents were aware of the rule but didn't pay it any mind since there are non-whites in the neighborhood and there doesn't seem to be any effort to actually enforce that law. But the Fosters say that's not the point. Everybody knows that you can't enforce things like that. It still sends a message. It's so they're sending one right back. It's not the world that we want our kids to grow up in. Taking their outrage to community networking site Nextdoor.com, they're raising awareness among their neighbors, some of whom, like new resident Dwight Holko, didn't realize what they'd signed when they moved in. It should be reversed just to just get off the records. And, and just out of curiosity, I'd probably like to find out who did that law and what their background was. The motivation for that whites only policy according to the CCNR is that letting non-whites in would lower the property value of the community. These rules have been on the books since 1961 and the person in charge of enforcing them 
said he had no idea. It's really quite embarrassing. Brent Dennis has been with the El Dorado Hills Community yeah, Service District, which handles pay. rule enforcement for over 30 communities for four years. He says he can't explain why this rule was put in place, but says it's definitely not enforced, violates federal law, and he guarantees his staff will correct the problem promptly. Have our staff start to glean through all of those and just make sure there aren't any other examples like that that need to be updated. We'll try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. Around here we take care of our own. You cross that line, it won't take long for you to find out. I recommend you don't. My granddad gave me They say one day they're gonna round up Well that shit might fly in the city Good luck, try that in a small town See how far you make it down the road Around here we take care of our own You cross that line, it won't take long For you to find out, I recommend you don't Imagine you're on a road trip with your family. The year is 1954 and you're black. Segregation is law in the South and basically practiced everywhere else in America. You're traveling down the famed Route 66 and you've just reached Albuquerque, New Mexico for the first time. There's not another town for miles and you want to pull over and sleep for the night. There are over a hundred motels to choose from, but less than eight will take you in. Picking the wrong one could lead to a humiliating encounter or worse, a violent one. But there was actually a way to know where you'd be welcome. It was in the Green Book. Americans fell in love with the idea of the road trip in the mid 20th century. A growing middle class meant more people had cars and jobs with paid vacation time. And a newly built interstate highway system meant the country was accessible to a big part of the population for the first time. The open road indicated freedom, and traveling by car reflected Americans' image of themselves. Self-sufficient, curious, and spontaneous. It was a way for families to spend time together and see the expansive country they called home, to experience America's cultural and natural diversity. Through the 1950s and 60s, the highway became the most common way for American families to travel. Motels and roadside attractions sprang up along the highway to accommodate travelers needing a place to sleep or eat at any point on their journey. But that freedom didn't extend to all Americans. Black motorists were turned away from the roadside hotels, gas stations, and restaurants that had taken over the American landscape. Some places were so hostile that it was unsafe to even get out of the car. Sundown towns forcibly expelled African Americans at night, sometimes violently. Black families had to take prepared food in case they wouldn't find a restaurant that would serve them, extra gallons of gasoline in case filling stations wouldn't sell to them, and even empty coffee tins in case they couldn't access a bathroom. They carried blankets and pillows, knowing that finding a safe place to sleep could mean camping by the roadside or driving long hours into the night, even though they had money to pay for a hotel. Sometimes that distance was fatal. It was the exact opposite of the spontaneous American road trip. But thanks to a Harlem postal worker turned travel agent, knowing where to go wasn't a total shot in the dark. In 1936, Victor Hugo Green collected information on hotels, restaurants, beauty salons, and mechanic shops that would reliably serve African Americans in New York City. He called his travel guide the Negro Motorist Green Book and began publishing an updated version each year. Using his network at the United States Postal Service, which was one of the largest single employers of African Americans at the time, Green put together detailed information on businesses and private homes that would welcome black travelers. The Green Book eventually grew to cover locations in all 50 states and sold ad space to businesses all over the country. With the help of Esso, now ExxonMobil, as a progressive corporate partner and distributor of the guides, around 15,000 copies of the Green Book started selling each year. Victor Green's once 16-page booklet ballooned to over 100 pages and became a staple item for black families who wanted to participate in the joy of cross-country travel. 
And it turns out that iconic image of the open road, of freedom and family values, would become an anchor in the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King even mentions it in his I Have a Dream speech. We can never be satisfied. As long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. The Civil Rights Act ended legal segregation in 1964. And just two years later, the Green Book went out of print. It had become obsolete. And as the road cut through the broad plains, you felt the tremendous space all around you. The country rolling out to the horizon, and you rolling with it. It was beautiful, and you sort of sensed the real meaning behind the word freedom. How do I know y'all a singing group? Why don't y'all sing something? Got nothing but love for you, 